Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Rooster Teeth's Genlock, Season 1, Episode 1, The Pilot. What's really funny is the pilot is quite literally named The Pilot. Yeah, but the episode is about a pilot. Yeah, that's what's great about it, though. It's like, it's a pilot to the show, but it's also about the pilot. <laughs> so I'm like, I see what you did there. Just a quick note, they didn't explain it. I hope they do in the future. Those planes would kill any normal pilot. The G-forces that would apply to any human pilot would have them either black out or worse things. <laughs> but on a non-scientific standpoint, those planes had some nice maneuverability. Perfect for urban areas. And so far, I'm liking animation, though it seemed kind of either i got used to the frame rate they're using or they smoothed it out throughout the episode i think they smoothed it out because in the very beginning when chase's mom was cutting up stuff and cooking it for dinner it was like jojo's bizarre adventure cg levels of painful yeah i was thinking it's nowhere near as bad something more akin to uh dragon prince that would be another good example I haven't actually seen the show, I'm just talking about my experience from the trailers. Because, oh my god, from what I understand, the show's actually, like, animated to 15 frames a second. What the heck were you even thinking? Animation's done to 24! But back to Genlock. Which is, first episode's 32 minutes long. Wow. That feels like, I, I know I haven't really seen many other Rooster Teeth shows, but... That's like a, that's even longer than a full length episode of a TV show. Because that was 33 episodes of content. But if you break that down to more Ruby level episode lengths, it was probably a two part premiere. Because I didn't look at the next episode. I think it was like 20 something. So this show seems to be like hovering around actual show length. But they say an average of 23 minutes, then they're targeting a normal TV show's length, which is about 23 minutes because that makes it a half an hour with commercials. Well, they used to be 27 minutes. And there's lots of nice little flares, and I like how they set up the world, in a way, with how technology is in that world anyways. And we get to see civilian technology levels with the mom... And the cooking and the helping hand, the daughter, you know, at first you think, oh, she's playing a video game. No, she's actually live streaming. Yeah, and getting auto-tuned because that's not her real voice because I love that little cut where, because the moment I saw that, I'm like, in the real world, she's sounding terrible. Because yeah. the real world, oh yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, and the little sisters, real quick. You're welcome for the setup. I'm like, that's that's awful. You are a terrible little sister. You are a little sister. <laughs> Very much so. And just lots of subtle things. Because as you're watching this, you're like, why is there only dinner for two? Oh, they can't stay for dinner. They have to get back. No, there's more than that. And then we see the fist bump between the girlfriend and the sister. And you see that little flicker of energy and coloration. You're like, Oh, something just happened there. The real question is, in my head, is are they holograms? Or is it some type of projection? Because their eyes, everyone's eyes, shows some type of kind of digital readout over the um, irises and stuff like that. So I'm almost thinking that that's more of a display inside of whatever's on the eyes. It's not actually something being displayed in the real world. This is all augmented reality. Well, we also get little hints of that when you see the walls of the home kind of flicker when the attack comes in. I think the mom and the sister are alive. I'm willing to believe that they're alive because the mother seemed like she really had her act together. So, especially with her son in the military... She would know what to do in these situations and would be more prepared than the average civilian. And what she did when she saw what was going on, she like basically went, nope, we're out of here. Immediate reaction. We've got the plan. We're using it now. We're going. No arguing. We're done. And if I hadn't have seen the trailers, I might have believed that he died sacrificing himself. I wasn't going to believe it at all because I'm like, 
And that's the classic setup. Hero sacrifices themselves in the beginning of the movie, female love interest moves on, then male comes back, and there's complications. Um, when she actually meets up with him physically, I have a feeling she's gonna deck him really hard. Oh yeah, because she has been in mourning. And she probably, since it's been about five years, she may have just recently gotten over it. In terms of being able to deal with the emotions and accept what happened and be more at a functional level. And now this is going to start all back up. Mm -hmm. This is like a gut punch. Especially since he, I don't think he's real. Based on the end of the, um, I, I don't know if that's going to be the intro or if it's just what they did at the credits, but I have a feeling based on Rooster Teeth's behavior with Ruby, that, is the intro to the show. And out of all the pilots, he seems to be the only one that flickers. So while I think all of them have some sort of weird scientific forged connection and some sort of VR thing, Avatar style, that he's more fully integrated. The thing is, it sounds exactly like him. So how did they get that? Did they recover his body? Did they study tapes? Because his craft was caught in what was the equivalent of an EMP. So his craft was completely offline, but he was above water. So theoretically survivable. And while we were watching the episode, I was thinking about how they set up the beginning of the episode. Because the beginning of the episode, they dive right into a family. So I was trying to figure out why they did that instead of starting off with action. And I think that's a hint in what they're going to focus on. I mean, there's going to be action in this show. It's going to be a lot about relationships and values and humanity. It's going to be about the characters. It's going to be a show where the character interaction is the thing. The plot's going to happen around them, but it's not going to be the focus. The focus is going to be on the people interacting with the plot. Because we don't even still have a lot of information on what the group that apparently we're supposed to root for is fighting against and why and how. You know, we don't know why these people are attacking and using nanotechnology. We don't even know if they're if a lot of them are people. They probably are because we see civilians in the attacked area showing markers indicating that they actually belong to that side. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. And I love how the... I'm just going to say wife of that person was like, what the F, man? Yeah, but, you know, it kept you alive that day. So the real question is, is he was he truly loyal or was this, hey, backup plan? Yeah, I'm thinking about that. And the way he reacted, I don't think he's actually a full-fledged member. I think he heard about what was going to happen, got a deal, and basically has immunity. You know, basically like diplomatic immunity, as it were, without the whole diplomatic thing. Something more like that. And that one thing that was really over the top for me while in, in the series, I'm like, oh, of course, we have to have a close up on a mother carrying a very young child. And we have to have the touching scene of her trying to get the child on a transport and they'll be separated forever. But at least the child will survive. And oh, no, the plane that has the baby on it is getting attacked. <laughs> and another cliche. If your movie contains actual landmarks, that landmark will be destroyed at one part of the movie or episode. Yes, well, they got it out of the way quickly, but it was handy because it gave you a sense of scale because, holy freak, one of those things' legs was taller than the Statue of Liberty. Yow. Also, it was very insect-like. Very insect-like. A lot of it is very insect-like, and even the close-ups they give us of the nanos, the nanos are very insect-like. And that's like another contrast in my head between what we currently know as the good guys and the bad guys. Because if you notice, the bad guy stuff was very overly technology, very bug and insect-like, and the good guy side is very human, very, everything is very anthropomorphic, very more animals, and very more human-shaped. So that's a nice contrast. Also, they seem to be using the Japanese color scheme for evil. Because everything was purple that was on the bad guy's side. But we also have purple in the Genlock team. 
one of the five, their entire theme is purple. Maybe she has a sketchy background. Yes, because you always have to have one of those in your team of five. Of course. Also, I couldn't quite like... I'm getting a weird mix of Gundam Wing and Zone of Enders out of the mix. Yeah, see, I don't really know Zone of Enders, so I'm kind of getting a combination of Gundam Wing and Power Rangers. I'm like, if they combine, <laughs> so help me. <laughs> uh, speaking of mix, what do you think of them so far in this series? And is your burnout affecting your enjoyment of the show? It will probably affect future episodes should we continue to view them because the Genlock style mechs are the mechs from my burnout period. The mechs that the regular level military was using were more like the stuff you saw in the CG animated Roughnecks. I would also compare it to Mech Warriors, the video game series Mech Warriors. Because they're very squanched and bulky and stuff like that. And you have to worry about your weapons overheating and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's not really what we saw in Gundam, Gundam Wing, Big O, Escaflone. Those all, even though they were very mechanized, they had an overall more sinuous design. And that's what these five, based on the intro that was shown as the outro, are going to have. I'm, like, really enjoying the designs, but I'm seeing the classic hints of stereotypes. Like, there's the big brawny one that apparently has a chain, like, whip kind of thing. Because I saw it fling something out of, out of an enemy mech and pull it close, then jump up on top of it. And then there's the sniper mech, which has a cloaking device. Which apparently belongs to the, the purple girl. And just there's a skating one, and then of course there's the flying one with the wings and everything. Then you have the more ground-based one, the red one with the bull horns. So yeah, you're getting kind of the stereotype of like we're gonna have the brawny one, the fast one, the agile one, the, the sneaky one, you know. So what will be interesting is whether or not they actually use those stereotypes, or if they're setting us up for a bunch of fakeouts. Please be setting us up for a bunch of fakeouts. <laughs> Because already a lot of this is kind of predictable for those who watch any of these genres. Like, oh, yeah, the city is the city his family's in. He's going to deviate from orders and supposedly get himself killed. At least he seems to be a normally rule-following person. Unlike a lot of the classic Maverick pilots that get rewarded for being that cocky. Because I'm like, okay, if he survives this, he better get such a dressing down because he disobeyed orders. Which is kind of like an American theme because in real military, oh my god, that guy would be court-martialed so quick. I mean, the papers would be filed the moment he disobeyed orders. Yeah, he wouldn't even have time to get off the field. Yeah, but apparently it's an American thing that, yeah, we need this rookie person because... Yeah, to find the person, the individual. I'm like, yeah, but here's the thing. You don't, she don't want a person like that in the military. No, because the military needs to work as a cohesive unit. I mean, the orders in this case were perfectly reasonable, so he had to follow them. There are cases where the orders aren't reasonable. And that's a time where you can disobey orders. It's still frowned upon, but... But there's reasonable justification for disobeying but when you see that the other pilot was taken out because they were charging the type of weapon that you want to set off then there is a reasonable assumption by the military commanders that you will not be able to set off the weapon and you will just get yourself killed so yes go cover the civilians and withdraw because you can't use the weapon you were just authorized to use because we just saw it fail spectacularly with following those orders to increase the chances of the civilians getting out unharmed. While still hopefully allowing the military to retain one more fighter. Because it wasn't just a straight retreat, it was a cover the civilian transports for as long as you can, but also get yourself out. Two-fold order. Protect the civilians and withdraw. That's a perfectly reasonable order. So, yeah. Court-martial. 
But oh. instead, he's getting rewarded in some form because whether this is the remains of his body that has been completely incapacitated, you know, because we see him in the city and they do a lot of work to show that the city is still populated with civilians during the fight scene and that they have to be careful of that because when he has the plane up sideways, he's looking into the window at a disabled older man who obviously can't evacuate. But he could very easily take that kind of damage and then they could just VR project him into this whole genlock thing. Like I said, just Avatar with mechs. <laughs> I was laughing at the ideas like, Avatar with mechs, what would I do in a mech? Wrong Avatar. Oh, that Avatar. Okay, mine's funnier, but I get what you're going for. Yeah, every time I have said Avatar in this recording, I meant that one, not the good one. <laughs> Dances with wolves, except with giant blue people. Also, Disney's Pocahontas. Also, The Last Samurai. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And from what I understand, there actually is some type of, like, only certain people are compatible with these new mechs kind of thing going on. Of course there is, because that's standard mech fodder. Because we already know Chase is too old to fall into the... These can only be piloted by teenagers, <laughs> especially since this is four years later. I just remembered. I'm too old, man. I can't pilot this thing. What do you mean? I don't remember how. <laughs> Dude, you just piloted it last week. Yeah, but I just turned 21. <laughs> uh, also, another thing I have to say, chicks dig giant robots. <laughs> That was such a fun show. And talking about the show again, voice actors. I am surprised by a lot of big names in this. I can't name all of them, but I can name one. David Tenham, I think his name is. Basically, he was a Doctor Who and he plays Scrooge McDuck. Yes, it was David something. And in the last name started with a T. The name that stood out to me when they were scrolling across the screen, not that I was looking super close, was Dakota Fanning. I'm like... Why do I know that name? Sounds like a singer. I'll Google it later. Mm -hmm. I want to set everybody's Android phones off. <laughs> also, I, I like the music that was playing during the um, outro, which will probably be the intro. It was a nice, solid music. And they had good use of music throughout, you know, because they were very misleading in the beginning. Because if you hadn't seen any of the trailers, you'd be like, oh, it's a rom-com. Yeah, especially with the way the sister <laughs> was treating the girlfriend. Oh, no, even sooner than that, because the mom bringing out the embarrassing childhood stories and the the visual communications between Chase and her while that was happening, because they took the time to put in the amused glances and the, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Just indulge your mother. <laughs> And that reminds me of the part later, like, yeah, we're going to have to do this later with your parents and hear your embarrassing stories. Wait, no! <laughs> <laughs> that's not how this works! Also, that's totally not how this works. We we only do that on one side. Uh, and those nanomachines were kind of terrifying. <laughs> Just a little bit. as We didn't get to see white what happens like so is it killing them is it assimilating them is it the basis of what ended up being done to get the genlock max because mm. the other team seems to have way more powerful technology yeah especially since they, it looks like they have a very similar mech in that intro at the end so that's going to be interesting i'm definitely interested in watching more of this series but We'll see about time and everything. It does have me more engaged than some other pilots that we've watched. But we'll we'll see how things go. I'm kind of glad we stopped here because questions haven't been answered yet. So we can speculate like crazy because we really don't know. And you guys will probably hold it against us in the comments. But we only watch the pilot. Take it down a notch. No spoilers. Calm down. Thank you. 
you know, if you watched ahead, don't comment about that too clearly in the comments. Or don't comment about all. You talk about this episode all you want and what you thought at the time. That's the best kind of comment. That way we can get engaged in a conversation. Because conversations are awesome. Overall, what do you think about the art style? Well, like I said in the beginning, it seemed like overly CG. And then it got better. It smoothed out. There's definitely a huge difference in the movements of the hero team and the opposing team because, you know, theirs move a lot more sinuously and smoothly. Even their humanoid ground fighters seem to move more smoothly than the human fighters that are the defenders of the city in the fight. Mm. Also, we're, we're, I know we're talking animation, but since we're cutting back to the fight, because that was where I was describing information, Ooh, your own little ground mech got hacked and they had to take out their own mech. It's not really a mech because nobody's inside piloting it, but they're ground level robot. So if that can be hacked, what else could have been hacked? Can they hack the planes? Can they hack the mech units? Maybe, but I don't think they can hack the new mech units yet anyways. Probably not. Because there was clearly an attempt to do so in the episode. Mm-hmm. And utterly failed. Yep, it actually literally said failed across the... And the poor guy looked surprised, and then... Bam. And, and the, um, this is going on to a little bit of character here. The way he reintroduced himself, I'm like, I wouldn't have done that with being dead for that long. That seemed very crass. Incredibly so. So you have to wonder, does he know it's been four years? Also... Even if you don't know it's been four years, you gotta know at least that it's been a little while and you're in the middle of a battlefield. Do not shake someone else's concentration. And I was mostly talking about the whole hologram reveal at the end there. Like, hey guys, I've missed some stuff. Yeah, hey guys, what I miss? Yeah, I'm like, I get the joke and I get the attitude, but I'm like, that that's like very crass to everyone else's feelings. I especially think I think he knows he's been dead, so I would have started with an apology, <laughs> like, "Hi everyone, sorry I haven't contacted you, but that's top secret. I'm here now," because I have a feeling that's exactly what he's going to say to people. Why didn't you tell us you were alive? Top secret. Mm -hmm. Also, I still hold on to he's either truly not alive at all, and this is entirely a simulation. Or the physical body is damaged beyond repair, and this is just a psi link. Hmm. Possible. Um, I'm going to say probable because it's very clearly a hologram in the room. But they already showed us that that technology existed four years prior. So theoretically, that could just be a projection, and he's still back with the mech. But we saw the mech holding on to one of the transport planes. So we know the mech came back. Yep, I think they're actually in a another room somewhere. Though that reminds me of um, the scene when the doctor first arrives and she asks him, so do you have any luggage or anything? And he goes, just a little bit. And then you see a bunch of trucks. Another stereotypical response that, oh no, I only packed the essentials. Rarity, that is 14 trunks of luggage. Just the essentials. I also like the, take me to your leader. I've always wanted to say that. Which apparently is an Easter egg reference back to an episode of Doctor Who he was in. <laughs> uh, what else would you like to go over? That apparently some characters don't change in four years. Four years later, you're still trying to hit on the woman and still getting shot down. Four years, you haven't learned the answer is always going to be no. I was thinking of bringing that up. Yeah. I guess he's like, I don't know if he's been constantly trying to hit on her or if he thinks it's been long enough now and he's now like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Either way, she's just not that into you. Yeah. As in, like, at all. I do like the fact that they did show that he was like that in the past and not just a recent thing. So, so far, this show is doing a pretty good job of setting things up and delivering on them. But going into that behavior, once again, in a military situation, that is highly inappropriate. The relationship with her and Chase was also highly inappropriate. 
which they took pains to point out. They're like, nobody's told us to stop yet. Implying, yeah, against regulations. So, and just in a general workplace environment, you should not hit on your coworkers. Especially in this whole Me Too movement era kind of thing. Big stuff going on. So, Do you know how many of my customers used to hit on me? It was ridiculous. I mean, I seriously considered wear, starting to wear a ring just to shut them the hell up. Wow, I don't think that would have done much. But yeah, especially since some of the jerks I have encountered, you know, the word no is the word no. It means stop, desist, do not go any further, do not pass go, do not click $200. <laughs> And I can see where the animation from this was used and helped influence some of the stuff that's going on in Ruby. Because apparently there's a lot of cross-pollination between this show and Ruby, especially in crowd scenes. So I can clearly see how they've influenced each other, especially since they kind of have a similar art style. But Ruby's more, even in the dark areas, very brightly colored, very cartoony, very pastel. Even with all the tech they have, it's still very much fantasy, and even dark fantasy has a different color palette than a more scientific series. Mm -hmm. That's part of how you tell animation genres apart just by channel surfing. You look at that and go, oh, this is this type of show because of all the visual cues, because Japanese animation uses visual cues like that to shortcut telling the audience stuff about the characters. We don't have to spend time on character development. If we do this, this, and this, the audience knows it's this type of character and they'll fill in all the blanks for us. Yeah, and I was going to also switch over to the what the color palette is for this show, which is a lot of muted colors. Not a, not a lot of colors pop, except when they want them to, to emphasize things, like the new mix. Their colors pop compared to everything else. And it's because they want you to focus on these new mix. Though the intro had a lot of shots, but the shots that were actually in this episode of the mix, I think were a little too close a lot of the time. So you didn't really see a lot of the action. You saw a lot of big parts moving in front of the camera and you couldn't quite, it got confusing at times. But in the intro, it was much pulled back. We still got a sense of scale and we still got a sense of power and movement compared to, um, the, the scenes we did see with these new mechs, there were a, a lot of heavy close-ups on stuff, at least for objects of that size. Yeah, you tend to have to have things further back so you can get that sense of scale, because you need comparison. That's where it was so great when they showed that giant enemy craft coming through the water and taking out the Statue of Liberty. That gave you a great sense of comparative scale. Going on to a mech movie, uh, Specific Rim. That first movie did an excellent job of giving you scale and making you feel like these things were big, giant robots moving in a realistic, moving in a realistic environment. To fight big, giant monsters in a totally realistic way. Yeah, as much as realistic as you could. But they also did a great job of having the camera far enough back from the action to really make it so you can feel it. This was a real big problem in the first Transformer movies. The cameras were always so close to the action that you couldn't get a sense of what was going on. Yeah, it was kind of a whole can't see the forest for the trees type of deal. Well, I'm interested in seeing more, but we'll see. And this has been our thoughts on Genlock, season one, premiere episode, the pilot. Oh, hey, another video, another not canned outro. Yes, the absolute final tagline is can, but I had pretty good phrasing. So thank you for watching, staying till the end, or fast forwarding to the end and listening to the outro. Either way, you're here and thank you. The usual, like, subscribe, share, comment, watch other videos, ring the bell, and then when you're ready to leave YouTube, because, you know, you have to eventually, but we do have playlists before you do. Uh, we have links for other places like Lux's Art, Lux's Patreon, Lux's Tumblr, my Tumblr, uh, some affiliate links that may get us a little bit of kickback. You know, pretty standard uh, YouTube stuff. Oh, I don't think we've mentioned it lately. Lux does have a Zazzle store. 
you know, he does work digitally, but with Zazzle, you can get his stuff on physical objects. Isn't that amazing? Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogues, suggestions, and of course financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.